Could you tell us a little about how you got started with letterpress? Yeah, it was not something that I did as a, to make a living. I was a carpenter and uh, did some writing on the side all my life. And when I retired, you know, in my 60s, I was concentrating on how to get a book together. And someone suggested letterpress because I was a craftsman. Why don't you make your own books? And I thought, okay, you know, and took a course at the San Francisco Center for the book and was cooked. I just loved it right away. As I was just telling you, uh, here I was working and there was no loud noise and there was no dust in my face. And I thought, nice way to work. It's also measuring and fitting and hand intensive concentration, hand eye concentration, and I really liked it. And the second thing was I noticed that I really loved the way I felt about the language as I set type, that it was sculptural, that I was looking at a poem I had written and changing my mind as I set the type because it didn't look right. Huh. That the graphic power of this little, these little typefaces uh, in your hand changed how you felt about the language you had written. And that also influenced me right away that I've always liked the graphic effect of poetry on the page, but I never thought much about type, typography, you know, mm -hmm. and I had uh, not very long before that been asked by a publisher what typeface I wanted for a book we did and didn't know. I mean, I don't know. And they said Garamond. So several things opened up for me at the same time, interest in type, graphics, uh, the production of a book, the making of the forms that make the book. And I got hooked and started collecting stuff. I got a press right away, I set it up in my garage. I apprenticed myself to uh, an elder um, statesman of poetry over in Santa Rosa named Don Amblin, who had a press in his garage and um, set up a press in my garage. And then uh, about three years into that, I had produced a book and a few other things. And one of my writer friends suggested that I get a shop. And I was getting tired of working in my garage also. So I found this place um, after about a year of looking. And I didn't know exactly how to be a public letterpress person. But, and he had suggested teaching people. So I, I announced a class in letterpress and had some people come in and we, we set type and did a couple of poems and they got excited about it. And I felt, why are they excited about this? This is a really esoteric art. I, I don't know if I want a lot of people interested in this. And, uh, but they insisted on coming back for another class. And um, I meanwhile produced another book and I felt pretty good about the space. Um, and so I'm giving you about a 10 year run here, but it happened rather fast once I rented a place uh -huh. that more people took classes. Some wanted to stay with me and do their own books. Um, and within a few years, we had formed a group here that um, is still basically together. A dozen people that have worked together for eight, nine years, each person doing their own projects. Sometimes there's a commercial job, you know, like mm -hmm. you have to do later. Somebody wants a, a beautiful business card, so we'll do that. So while I did poetry books for people, but it was so labor intensive that it was I had to charge them too much. Mm -hmm. I didn't really like that. It was kind of, I mean, they could do it online on a desktop publishing for a tenth of what I had to charge them. So it yeah. it, it mainly this evolved into a studio collective of people who I see for very different reasons. You know, like there are printmakers here who are new to the whole phenomenon of using the language in your printing. And there are more literary people who are new to concepts of composition, color, ink, you know, all the things that a press uh -huh. can give you. Um, and then we, we've just had a very good time together. I mean, that, I think, I think the milieu, you know, the, the context, like, the text, I mean, the texture of this work is such that you're just obsessed with language in particular and you're sculpting it and you're seeing this rush of color 
popping off the press and you're excited, you're showing friends and uh, it snowballs. Uh -huh. we, just, we just enjoy this a great deal. How, how many presses do you have here and, and what sort of age, well, age range are they? <laughs> there are really um, seven principal presses and there are a couple of little almost toy-like presses that are collector's items that we don't use. Uh -huh. And there are 250 fonts of type. Wow. Each font being what people would think of as a drawer, but these are always called cases by printers. So each one has a particular type face, like Castellan old style, in a size 14 point. And this is lowercase, and this is uppercase. Huh. In the old days, it took two such cases, and there would be one here for the small letters and one here for the big letters. Ah. And then the name, uppercase uh -huh. and lowercase, oh. stuck. Okay. But there's a lot of them here, 250 wow. plus all so, kinds of other typing elements like these um, dingbats and... Oh, my Lord. Um, I That's have thousands fantastic. of these things because every old printer had to have a collection um, because, you know, in normal sort of job printing, like you had to do something for the Rotary Club. Well, they wanted a little emblem or a star-shaped thing, maybe a guy painting a house. So you had to have things like uh -huh. that. Do you know where the name Dingbat comes from? Huh? Do you know where the word the Dingbat word comes from? They don't actually know. Uh -huh. I I studied it. <laughs> One theory was that it was the sound, the ding, the, the sort of clink of working with them. Uh -huh. um, I really don't know. The the type that you have here it became obsolete commercially when digital printing came along. So it's, so was was it easy for you to find this stuff? When I began this, there were still some old shops, and many of them were falling by the wayside, and there would be an auction. Uh -huh. And in the back, they'd have a, several of these um, cabinets full of type, which you could get very cheap then. Um, that doesn't happen so much anymore. Then there are some people who still make type. There are um, type founders. Wow. Maybe a dozen in the uh, United States. Um, and so you can buy fresh made lead type from them. And that's to support people like yourself? Well, sometimes I have a really particular desire for a type of a kind, uh -huh. and I haven't come across it, you know. And I go on the internet and check with the five or six people I know of that are making type, and they'll sell me what, a font. What would it cost to buy a font? Maybe 80 bucks. For oh. A combination of the upper and lower cases. Are they using... But that's not a lot of type. You might have to buy another one set, you know, so it might cost you a couple okay. hundred. And are they using different technology than, than... The technology of it? Yeah, when they when they can make you a set of type for 80 bucks. Oh, that's it, an amazing machine. Like a, <laughs> One of the most brilliant old-style machines I've ever seen that does the type founding, yeah. the caster. It's a monotype machine, and it's um, only as big as a press like that. But it has a lead cooker. It's not just lead, it's lead with some antimony and tin, and um, an injection system that squirts the hot lead into a mold, and the mold contains all the letters of the alphabet, lowercase, uppercase, the figures, the punctuation, and it's about this big, and it moves like this. Exposing it's exactly correct, like the A, is suddenly exposed to that jet of metal, and it squirts in, and then it pops out, and it moves to the next one. And the thing that's controlling that is making this matrix of molds align perfectly is a roll of paper with perforations. Oh, wow. Just like a roller piano. Wow. And you've composed it by typing on perforations onto this roll of paper. You're doing the text of a book and you're just typing it and it's making holes. And you put that paper into the machine and it rolls through 
and as each hole passes over the uh, pneumatic blast, uh -huh. the location of it is translated mechanically to move that matrix up and down wow. just a little bit. Fast, though. And wow. these little single types are coming out. <laughs> and they just work, they come out in a little soldierly rank and file coming down a little way. Like, <laughs> it, it makes you just gasp when you see it working. Wow. It's really quite amazing. Uh, how old is that technology? Very few people know how to do it. It's very complex. The typing of the, the roller, yeah. the roll is, you know, it's way beyond just learning how to type. I mean, it's, uh -huh. Spacing, you know, leading, space, so on. How, how old is that technology? Uh, turn of the last century, was, it, I think it was probably about 1890. And it came into big use in the early part of the 20th century. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a woodworker. I, w I want to know about the, uh, the wooden type that you have. The wooden type was made earlier than that. Uh-huh. Um, they devised... In the 1830s, I think, they devised a kind of uh, pump foot pedal router that you could make the stencil of this type. Yeah. And then there was a cutting tool. As you moved it around on the stencil, it cut the face. Uh-huh. And then they'd trim it carefully. Yeah. It's, they're beautiful, those. And they... Each, each, Can I show you some? I, I've seen some, but you haven't shown me any. What I've seen is that, uh, oh, yeah. This is from... Um, this is cowboy type. 1850s, actually. No, 70, 1870. Wow. The thing is, they're... They're cut into um, the end grain of... Boxwood. Usually boxwood, yeah. if they could get it, or maybe maple, maple or something. Yeah. And then... In use, you saw the ink, and it's linseed oil based. Mm -hmm. So the ink itself is soaking in here, you know, it's coating it and so on. And preserving it. Yeah, very few of these type, I mean, I have hundreds of them, have any sign of um, check or warp. And it's wow. quite remarkable. Can I see one? In some ways, they've endured better than the metal types from that. Really? That long ago. Look at it, psych the straightness of it. Amazing. Yeah. That's a nice bold letter. <laughs> That's great. You know, some of our uh, posters, you can see them. Like, see that character flaws? I think the flaws are from that one you just looked at. <laughs> And the other wonder of the shop for a collection is these, what are roughly called cuts. Um, they're electro-engraved plates that are attached to wood base. Yeah. And they're all at the same height as type. So if I put this next to some type, it'll print at the same moment. Mm -hmm. And here's a man with his, uh, ah, he's in his phonograph. <laughs> Some of these are pretty old. The ones that are copper, I think, are generally the older, back before 1900. Huh. These are reproduced from a very old um, Renaissance book on medicine. Wow. A friend of mine did a book with these. What's this? Wow, this this is amazing. What is this? A baby in utero? 
It's a fetus, no? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. A, a medical drawing of a fetus. Wow. Inside. Photographs, yeah. Really? I found this set of photographs of a class. Of um, Whittier College. And when I printed them, I found Richard Nixon on it. No. <laughs> yeah. That's not it. This is him here, I think. No, right there. That's Nixon. Good Lord. So Very it is. Little. Unmistakable. Yep. <laughs>